everybody. My name is Mason Everett. I'm a second year veterinary student at the Texas A&M College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences here with the PEER program to talk with y'all today about snakes and snake bites. We're going to go into a little bit about some of the structural components of the snake. Then we're going to talk about how to determine if you're looking at a non-venomous versus a venomous snake. We're going to talk about some snakes native to the United States that are venomous, and then we are gonna go into snake bites and our treatment options following a bite. So like I said, we need to talk about some of the structural components that can cause some of the greatest issue when a snake, if a snake chooses to bite somebody, particularly a venomous snake. So the probably most well-known component of a venomous snake is going to be the venom itself. Venom is actually modified saliva that contains two important components. The first being that it contains proteins that act to immobilize and kill the prey. And the second is going to be that it contains enzymes that are gonna to help to begin digesting that prey, which is going to be very similar to the enzymes found in the digestive tract of the snake. And then other components of venom are gonna cause issue with coagulation, so with the ability to clot blood, and then also with the ability of the prey or whoever is bitten to regulate their blood pressure, which can end up having some pretty severe issues for that person or animal or prey that was bitten. So venom is stored in a venom gland and that's gonna be right here. And so it's just kind of waiting back there and then if a snake feels threatened or decides to bite some form of prey or anything like that, if they decide to bite and they want to inject, you know, potentially lethal dose, they will release that venom through their fangs. And we're gonna go into more about the fangs themselves, but just know for now that they possess a venom gland and then that venom is introduced through the fang itself in a bite. So how can we determine if we're looking at a non-venomous snake versus a venomous snake? That's really, really important because if you're really close to a snake, you probably wanna know pretty quickly uh, how potentially bad they could be if they were to bite you. So one crucial component to identifying a venomous versus non-venomous snake is going to be the shape of their pupil or the shape of their eye. Y'all can probably tell pretty quickly there's a pretty big difference between the picture on the left and the right in these snakes' eyes. So venomous snakes tend to have elliptical shaped pupils. They almost look like cat eyes. And a little bit later on, we'll see another picture where this pupil is a little bit more expanded. So they're not always as you know line-like almost like in this picture here but they tend to have this more elliptical shape versus a non-venomous snake, which is gonna have rounded pupils. And those are pretty, quite obviously just circles. So that's a pretty big difference between the two in a pretty uh, simple way, really, if you're that close to see their eyes to tell kind of quickly what you're looking at there. Also the shape of their head. So a non-venomous snake, if we look at this kind of side profile on the left side of the screen, really has kind of a rounded head kind of a rounded look to its head. And then if we look at our venomous snake, which is going to be the picture on the bottom, you'll notice he kind of has a flat head and then a very well-defined nose. And also, if you're kind of looking in his nose area, you're gonna see what almost looks like a second nostril between the eye and the actual nostril. And we're gonna talk about what that is, but that's going to again be characteristic of a group of our venomous snakes. And then if we kind of look at this top profile on the right side of the screen, you'll notice that our venomous snakes have kind of a triangle shaped head or a diamond shaped head. And that kind of wider part at the base of their head is created by those venom glands. And then if we look at our picture on the right, our non-venomous snakes are kind of kind of rounder heads. They're a little bit less definitive than our venomous snakes. And I have a picture way further in the slideshow that will, I'll make sure to make a point to show y'all that really triangular shape uh, to the head of our venomous snakes. So another way to tell a venomous snake from a non-venomous snake is going to be to look at their ventral scales. So this could be kind of hard to see in a live snake, but if you were kind of doing a post-mortem examination and you were trying to determine if you were looking at a venomous versus a non-venomous snake, you can look at their scales. These are gonna be kind of on their belly and this is going to be in their tail region, so past the anal plate. A non-venomous snake is gonna have dual rows of scales past the anal plate. That means like two rows of scales. Whereas a venomous snake is going to have a single row of scales after that anal plate, so kind of in their tail region. And this again is gonna be kind of on their tummy. 
So now we can get into venomous snakes that are common to the United States. We have two families that we're really concerned with. The first are our pit vipers, the family of Vapiridae. And this is going to encompass our rattlesnakes, our copperheads, and our cottonmouths or water moccasins. They're known by both cottonmouth or water moccasin. So we're gonna talk about hopefully both of the names throughout this. But if you hear one or the other, know we're talking about the same snake. And then the second family is going to be our elapids, the family elapidae. And in the United States, the only elapid that is common is going to be our coral snake. So the pit viper is going to be the largest group of venomous snakes, and they're found in Asia and the Americas. And they have a few identifying features that help them stand out from our other families of snakes. The first being the pit between their eyes and their nose. I had already mentioned this earlier, but if you look, it almost looks like they have a second nostril. That is going to be useful to them in heat sensing prey. So that's a very definitive feature of the pit viper. They're also going to have retractable fangs that are under voluntary control. That means these fangs can sit up higher in their face. They're not in their mouth. And when they want to, they can let them down if they decide they want to bite something, whether they're feeling threatened or prey or what have you. They have the ability to decide when these fangs come out. And so that's going to, again, be very definitive of the pit viper. And then also you can kind of notice here a little bit that he has a triangular shaped head and you can definitely see his elliptical shaped pupils. And like I said, they can expand a little bit. So it looks a little different, his pupil does, than we saw in the previous picture. But again, it's still not round like we saw in our non-venomous snakes. And I know it's a little bit hard to tell the shape of his head from the side profile, but I do have a better picture later on for you all. So the first United States pit viper that we can talk about is going to be our copperhead. If you look at these pictures over to the right, these are all different copperheads and different patterns that can be associated with the copperhead. So you need to remember that not just one pattern is definitive of the, of the copperhead. If you saw any of these, you would need to be concerned. And if you look in this picture on the left, this is gonna show where these copperheads like to live. So mostly they're in the Southeast United States. So they do you know, extend a little bit North, but as you see here, they are in Texas. And they're appropriately named based upon the copper appearance of the top of their head. They're generally quite small compared to some of other, our other pit vipers. And a really important thing to know about the copperhead is that they are considered offensive strikers. Some of our snakes, when they feel threatened, will try to avoid confrontation. Essentially, they may try to slither away or get away from the situation or give you a couple different warning signs. But the copperhead, when threatened, essentially will lead by biting. They will lead by striking. So if you encounter a copperhead, they may not give you much of a warning before they try to bite. As you can imagine, this is a really powerful defense mechanism for them. And so they generally allow it to be their first go-to. The next pit viper we'll talk about in the United States is going to be our rattlesnake. I feel like this is probably the one people are most familiar with. If you look in our picture on the left, you can see that they're pretty much in the central United States and everything east of it, just about. And the most defining feature, I would say, of the rattlesnake is going to be their characteristic rattle. But something people often misconstrue is the idea that the rattlesnake will always rattle its rattle prior to striking, that they will always, you know, make that noise to warn somebody before they decide to strike. And this is not true. Rattlesnakes tend to like to bite first and rattle later. And so you need to be aware that just because you're around a rattlesnake and it's not rattling doesn't mean it isn't, you know, already on the defensive and thinking about potentially striking. And if you look here, these are all different types of rattlesnakes and their subspecies. So the patterns vary widely, the colors vary widely, and you just need to be aware, again, that if you see a snake, and just because the pattern doesn't match the one that you've seen for rattlesnake doesn't mean it isn't a rattlesnake. You know, we have a ton of different ones here and the majority of rattlesnakes are going to possess that rattle. Essentially, if you see a snake and for some reason you're really concerned, you know, you've already defined all the features of a venomous snake, you need to move away 
even if you're not convinced that it's per se a rattlesnake. So the next US pit viper that we'll talk about is our cottonmouth or our water moccasin. And again, remember those terms are interchangeable. One of their defining features when they feel threatened is that they hold their mouth open. It's called gaping behavior. If you look at the picture in the middle here, the snake is sitting there with his mouth propped wide open. And that's his way of telling you, you know, I'm not comfortable with the situation right now. They will also vibrate their tail rapidly when they feel disturbed. So it's almost like a rattlesnake without the rattle. They're trying to tell you, hey, you need to get away from me. And then a definitive feature of the cottonmouth or the water moccasin is that they're considered defensive strikers. So let's, you know, compare that with our uh, copperhead where we said that they are offensive striker. The copperhead wants to strike first, essentially, but the cottonmouth is going to try a couple of different tactics, probably try to get away from you before it decides that it needs to strike you. So the majority of time people end up getting bit is because they've come way too close to these guys, potentially stepped on them or grabbed them or something of that nature, is generally we, when we see a cottonmouth or water moccasin bite. And if we look here, they are really common in the south, southeast United States. And again, they are present in Texas. So, you know, cottonmouths and water moccasins, they're considered water snakes to some extent. They will go in the water pretty readily. And that can be really confusing when we start trying to decide if we're looking at a cottonmouth or a water moccasin, or if we're seeing some other form of water snake that could be non-venomous. So we need to be able to tell when we see one moving through the water, what we're looking at. So a really defining way that the cottonmouth or water moccasin likes to move in the water is that it essentially holds its head out of the water and keeps its entire body on the surface of the water. And I have a video here to show y'all that is demonstrating that. But most other water snakes are going to only travel with their head out of the water. The rest of their body will stay under. So that's a pretty simple way to tell what you're looking at here. But it needs to be understood that if a non-venomous or venomous water snake feels threatened, both of them are capable of diving under the water and they will strike underwater if they feel that they really need to. So let's watch this video just showing this guy. Look, he is almost completely out of the water. That head is all the way up and his body is sitting on top of that water. And so we can be pretty sure when we see that that this is a water moccasin and will probably want to move away pretty quickly so he doesn't feel the need, you know, to end up striking. So now we'll move on to our other family of snake, which is going to be the elapid. And like I said, in the United States, the only elapid is going to be our coral snake. And they are pretty much just real close to Texas and a couple other states. That's about it. So a little bit more concentrated than our other guys. The elapid is gonna have some identifying features that are different than the pit vipers. So the first one is going to be that they have small fixed fangs. They are gonna be different in that, like I said before, the pit viper is able to retract those fangs when they want to, but the elapid, and more specifically in our case, the coral snake is not gonna be able to do that. So these little bitty fangs are just going to be present at all times. And so when they end up biting something, it's less like a single strike. They can chew or gnaw a little bit, but there's a really common misconception that a, co or a coral snake is going to have to chew on their prey for a while to envenomate them. And that's just not true. They don't need too long to deliver a fatal dose of venom to their victim. And the difference between getting bit by an elapid versus a pit viper is that the coral snake has a much more potent neurotoxin in its venom than a pit viper. That means a neurotoxin means that it is going to attack the nerves in the central nervous system. So anything from your brain, your spinal cord to your nerves can be affected and that can be really, really serious for someone if left untreated. So what are the concerns with being bit by a coral snake? We just talked about a couple of them, but there's some more specific things about the bite itself that need to be understood. The first being that a coral snake rarely will produce tissue injury that's visible. So if you think of someone getting bit by a rattlesnake, you think two gaping holes, you think ton of swelling, you think 
you know, it's really, really obvious that this person or this animal has been bitten by a snake. But with a coral snake, because they just have those tiny little fangs, it might not be really visible that someone got bitten by a snake. And it can take up to 12 hours for them to start showing signs that they were bitten by a snake. So you, with a snake bite by a pit viper, you're gonna know pretty immediately, you might have some pretty severe swelling almost immediately that shows you, hey, this person was bitten by a snake and there was venom that was in that bite and this is bad and we need to go to the hospital now or we need to get them to a vet clinic, something like that. But with a coral snake, that animal may have, or a person may be able to go 12 hours without showing any signs that they were bit by a snake before all of the sudden, you're gonna start seeing these neurotoxic effects, again, affecting the brain, you know, spinal cord, nerves, stuff like that. So because of this, if someone has been bitten by a coral snake, they need to receive treatment. And if you have a suspected bite, you're not positive that someone was bitten by a coral snake, they need to be monitored for 12 hours to make sure that they don't start displaying signs of that neurotoxin. Because if you can imagine, once that damage begins to happen to the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system, so the brain, spinal cord, and nerves, it's gonna be irreversible. That's some really serious damage that we don't want to happen. So there is another snake called the king snake that looks a whole lot like the coral snake. And the picture on the left is our king snake, the picture on our right is our coral snake. And there are some defining features in the pattern of the two that can help you differentiate one, them from one another. So if you look at our coral snake, you're gonna notice that he has red bands touching yellow bands. And there's a saying that I hope most of y'all have heard that'll help you uh, to know which one is bad, which type of snake is bad and which is good. And if we look at our king snake on the left, you'll notice that the red bands are touching black bands. So the saying goes, red and yellow, kill a fellow, red and black, friend of Jack. So if you see red bands on yellow bands, we're looking at a coral snake, that snake is venomous and could potentially cause great bodily harm or be fatal. And then if we see red on black in our king snake, this snake is non-venomous. Of course, they can still bite, but they're not gonna deliver venom that could potentially be fatal. So now that we've gone through all of our venomous snakes in the United States, I want to test y'all's knowledge a little bit. So after this, y'all are gonna see some pictures and you can take a moment or two to decide if you're looking at a venomous snake versus a non-venomous snake and then possibly identify them. So take a look at this picture and decide, is this snake venomous or not? You can pause the video if you need a second. Yes, this snake is venomous. Can you determine what type of snake it is? This is a pit viper and it more specifically is a rattlesnake, as you can tell most definitively by his characteristic rattle. Is this snake venomous? Yes, this is a copperhead. And I want you all to take a look at the shape of his head. This is that picture I talked about way earlier when I said you can really see the triangle shape to the head. It's certainly not round, triangular diamond shaped head. And this guy definitely has got a triangular shaped head. Is this snake venomous? The answer to this one is no. This is actually a garter snake, most commonly found by most folks in their gardens, which is why they're often called gardener snakes, but their true name is the garter snake. Is this guy venomous? The answer to this is yes. This is going to be a water moccasin or a cotton mouth. And I want you all to take a look at the difference in the coloration in these three pictures. As you can tell, at least between the top picture and the middle picture, their pattern almost looks the same. By the time we get to the picture at the bottom, that snake is almost completely black. And their coloration changes with age. They generally get darker, like the picture on the bottom, as they get older. So you don't want to just use their coloration to determine if you're looking at a water moccasin or a cotton mouth um, or some other form of water snake. Is this snake venomous? The answer to this one is no. This is our king snake. And remember, 
red and black friend of Jack. You have those red bands next to black bands and therefore we can be pretty sure that we are not looking at a coral snake. Is this guy going to be venomous? The answer to this is yes, this is our coral snake. And remember, red and yellow kill a fellow. When we look here, we see red bands touching yellow bands, and therefore, again, we can be pretty sure that we are looking at a coral snake, certainly not looking at a king snake. So now that we've talked about all of our venomous snakes that are common in the United States, we're gonna talk a little bit about snake bites. There are gonna be a few defining features about the bite itself and our victim they're gonna tell us a little bit about the severity of the bite. The first one being the volume of the venom injected. Then we have the circumstances of the bite or the aggressiveness of the snake, the size of the victims themselves, the location of the bite, and then the activity level of the victim after the bite. And we're gonna go into detail about each of these. So the first one we talked about was the volume of venom injected. So let's ask another little question. Are younger snakes more venomous than older snakes? The answer to this is no. Younger snakes just lack the ability to control how much venom they inject. Will a venomous snake always inject venom with every bite? I found this answer rather surprising. No, they actually don't is actually more closer to 50% of bites contain venom. So as an older mature snake is going to be able to decide when or when not they want to inject venom. So it's not with every bite by a venomous snake that someone is injected with venom. And the next component we talked about the severity of the bite is the circumstances of the bite. The bite. Is this snake acting in self-defense or is it acting in aggression? Most of the time when a snake bites somebody, they're doing it as a defense mechanism. Remember we talked about offensive striker versus defensive striker and whatnot, but many will try to offer a warning sign. Like we said with the rattlesnake though, that is not always the case. We will say that if they want to, they can rattle first prior to striking, but that is not always true. And then other snakes, kind of like the water moccasin or the cottonmouth, can shake their tail, you know, maybe around something that can allow it to make a little bit of noise to try to tell you, hey, I'm here, leave me alone. But again, that is not always the case. Third, we can talk about the size of the victim. Essentially, in general, it kind of makes sense. A larger victim is going to uh, take longer for that venom to take effect, and therefore you have a greater window of time potentially to get them help. And that will generally improve survivability. So if we talk about a big horse uh, versus you know, a small puppy getting bit, there's gonna be a pretty drastic difference in the initial response to that envenomation. So the location of the bite can also have some pretty significant ramifications about the outcome for our patient. Severity of the bite is influenced by where on the body that the victim gets bitten. Generally, those areas with lower circulation are gonna be better, and we're gonna talk, are gonna fare better, we'll say, and we're gonna talk a little bit about why that is. And also, bites that are farther away from the heart tend to cause less damage to vital organs. So most of the guys in these pictures right here got bit on the face. The face, in large part, doesn't have fantastic circulation, we can say, compared to, let's say, getting bit on the arm or something like that, where there's lots and lots of vessels. So the nose or the face can be a better place to get bit for some patients, but we're also going to talk about how getting bit on the nose can be really, really bad. It all just depends, unfortunately. So why do pets often get bit on the nose? Animals tend to li live the world through their sense of smell, and therefore they tend to lead with their nose. And so if a snake is feeling threatened it is, and it decides to strike, it is going to hit you know, the closest structure, which in the case of a lot of our animal friends is going to be their nose. So we also talked about how the activity level of the victim after being bit can play a role into the severity of the bite. So when a victim's heart is pumping fast due to exertion or fear, you know, you just got bit by a snake, you're really freaked out, your heart is pumping really hard, Venom can reach the heart more quickly. So we have a little bitty demonstration of how that works. There's our heart. This dog, a guy, got bit on the backside. So that venom ends up traveling to the heart. And from the heart, 
it can go out into circulation and it start affecting other structures. And so if this heart's beating really fast and moving blood more quickly, in essence, that venom is going to move out to the heart and through the rest of the body more quickly as well. So the best thing to do if bitten is to try to remain as calm as possible and keep the heart rate as low as possible. Again, I can only imagine this would be really hard to do if you just got bit by a snake, but that is ideal following a bite. So what are the effects of venom? What can happen to our animals if they get bit? We just talked about how you know, we can have systemic effects when the venom reaches the heart and then goes out to all the other structures, but we also have some pretty severe local effects. So we're gonna talk about both of those. We'll start with our local effects, which means where the animal was bitten. That can involve rapid swelling, pain, edema, and necrosis, which is tissue death. And these symptoms really fall in line more so with our pit viper families, so our rattlesnakes, cotton mouths, and copperheads. Um, but if we look at this picture of this cow on the left, you can see that tissue damage on the side of its face. That's a pretty good example of necrosis. That tissue has died. You know, this animal at one point probably had a lot of swelling, uh, which we could um, even talk about in terms of edema. Edema is fluid accumulation. So that swelling and then uh, their fluid will pocket up in there too. So they'll have some edema. And then if you can only imagine, this would all be extremely painful. But again, we can also have systemic effects. Once that venom reaches the heart and then goes out into circulation, it can have some pretty severe uh, symptoms pop up for our animals because of that envenomation. So this can involve hypotension. Hypotension is a fancy way of saying it can affect their blood pressure, having low blood pressure specifically. So they're not moving blood throughout their body very well. It can also cause coagulopathies, which is another fancy term for having blood clotting issues. They can be weak, they can be nauseous, they can have cyanosis, which I'll talk about in just a second, and they can have convulsions or seizures. Cyanosis is going to involve poor oxygen supply to the tissues. So if you look at this, the gums of this dog in this picture, they're turning blue. And that is an indicator that this patient is not moving oxygen throughout their body well, and that is concerning because if it's not moving to these simple structures very well, it's not getting to the brain very well. And so this patient might begin suffering from signs of lack of oxygen to the brain and other very important structures as well. So venom can have some pretty severe effects on the respiratory system as well. Swelling can lead to a restricted airway, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. But also, remember how we talked about how coral snakes have really potent neurotoxins that affect the brain, the brain stem, and the nerves? They can lead to respiratory depression, meaning the body is incapable at this point of controlling the ability of expanding the airways to pull air into the lungs, and expanding the chest to pull air into the lungs as well. And, and also, venom can also cause vascular damage that results in pulmonary edema. And that just means that there's fluid accumulating in the lungs. If you can imagine, we generally like air to be in the lungs. So if there's fluid there, that can cause some pretty severe issues with breathing as well. So like I mentioned, if an animal gets bit and there's a lot of swelling, you can have obstruction to the respiratory tract. And this can impact breathing negatively. And um, it ends up happening a lot of times when an animal gets bit on its nose. Like we mentioned, a lot of animals end up getting bit on their nose. So we said that there's low blood circulation to the face compared to other structures of the body. So that can be valuable sometimes to the animal in that, you know, it might not move through to their heart and through the rest of their body system as quickly. But also if there's swelling around their face, they might not be able to breathe very well. So it's kind of a give and take there. And horses are really our poster child for this because they are obligate nose breathers, meaning they can't breathe through their mouth. They have to breathe through their nostrils. And if they get bit on their nose and there's a lot of swelling there, they don't have any other option. And so they're gonna be, not be able to breathe pretty quickly in the event that they do have a poorly placed bite on the nose or in the region of the nose even. So what can we do if a pet gets bitten by a snake? In the field, you know, basically if you're out and about and you're with your animal and they get bit and you have, you know, soap and water available, you can wash the wound really quickly. 
You can also reduce their exercise. Remember we said lowered activity level is going to be better in making sure that that venom doesn't move as quickly through the body. You can keep the bite wound level with the heart. There's a lot said about keeping it above or below. It is suggested that you keep the bite wound level with the heart. And then try to keep the animal calm. Again, this is going to help slow that movement of venom to the heart and then out to the rest of the body. And then try to get them medical attention as quickly as possible. What should you not do if your animal gets bitten by a snake? Definitely don't suck the venom out. This was commonly used back in the you know, 1900s. It was in like the 70s or something like that, 70s, 80s, um, and is definitely not recommended anymore. This can be really, really problematic for everybody involved, so don't do that. Don't ice or heat the bite either, and don't tie a tourniquet around it, especially if it's a bite by a pit viper. Those tend to swell a whole lot, and that tourniquet can end up being really, really damaging to your patient or to your animal at that point in time. And these, all of these treatments we talked about right here tend to delay you know, transportation of that animal to a treatment facility and therefore are not advantageous in the long run. At the vet's office, they'll probably wanna collect blood from your pet to check their values and see how much the venom is affecting them at that particular time. So they can use pack cell volume, which is just a fancy way of essentially seeing the concentration of red blood cells that are in the blood at that point in time. And it might be slightly decreased. They can also do a coagulation profile to see how well the blood is able to clot at that point in time. And then they can do a chemistry panel to check um, electrolyte changes, which we can go into a lot of depth on, but that's just another thing that they can do. And if coagulation is slow or absent, it, it would be a good time to administer antivenom. And then at that point, they'll also want to just provide supportive care. And they may have to ventilate your patient or your pet um, in the event that they were bitten by a coral snake. Remember we said those neurotoxins can cause respiratory depression, therefore they're not breathing very well. So we put them on a ventilator, which will help them breathe. Or if they got bitten in such a place that's causing an obstruction to their airway. So if they were bitten on the nose, if it's a horse that can't breathe very well, we might think about it then. Or you know, if we have some sort of canine patient that's struggling to breathe, we can go ahead and ventilate them as well. So what exactly is antivenom? Venom is gonna be collected from a snake. And at that point, we're going to go ahead and dilute its concentration. It then can be used in a vaccine or in a treatment. Um, some of y'all may have heard of rattlesnake uh, vaccinations. They're relatively common these days. Although it is important to understand that there haven't been any clinical trials to assess the efficacy of this vaccine. Um, but there is a lot of success in using treatment. So applying that anti-venom to a patient that has been bitten by especially a pit viper and it helps neutralize that venom. So anti-venom administration is going to involve um, administering one to two doses of that anti-venom intravenously, which means IV. So they're going to put it in the vein. And the dose given is not related to the size of the animal, but more so, you know, the effects of that venom that we're seeing in that animal. And we may continue to give them more doses just depending on how they're doing at that point in time. Other treatment options we have involve giving fresh frozen plasma. This is going to help uh, replenish those clotting factors. Like we said, these animals can have issues with blood clotting after being bitten by a venomous snake. And so by giving them more plasma, it helps replenish uh, platelets, which are components of blood that help to clot blood. We can also give IV fluids, which will help to replenish any fluid losses because they might be losing blood due to their inability to clot blood and whatnot. Um, and this is also going to restore circulating volume. So we have a certain amount of blood that we always want moving through the body. If that is decreased, fluids can help add back to that blood and make sure that we have the proper amount of blood moving through the body. Because once it starts to decrease, that can be super problematic for a patient. And then of course, we want some pain medication on board for our patients to help with the bite wound. Because these guys, again, you got big fangs, you know, that are going into your patient and then there's a lot of swelling and all sorts of other issues going on. And therefore we wanna make sure that they're not in a whole bunch of pain. So in conclusion, 
Antivenom is the only definitive treatment for venomous snake bites. There are other treatments that are often given to patients in the meantime, but if a patient is really in a bad way from a snake bite, antivenom is the best answer for them at that point in time. Early treatment is key. Like we said, that venom is trying to move to the heart and then move out through circulation to the rest of the body. So if we can get them treatment before that happens, ideally, we should be able to help them and help their prognosis and, of course, try to help improve their length of life at that point and quality of life. And then not all bites from snakes are venomous, but all snakes can bite. Remember that, you know, we said about 50% of snake bites actually contain, from a venomous snake, actually contain venom, which is a big surprise to me, honestly. But any snake is capable of biting, and therefore we don't want to mess with any snake. The best thing to do if you see a snake is to just leave it alone, regardless of whether or not you think it's venomous or not. We don't want to find out the answer to that the hard way, you know, so if you see a snake, Try to give it its space, respect the fact that they are all capable of biting, and in particularly the case of our venomous snakes, they can all look vastly different, and therefore we don't want to be guessing about whether or not we're looking at a water snake versus a water moccasin. We want to just go ahead and give them the space that they need uh, to make sure that everyone in the situation remains safe. So that pretty much wraps up all I wanted to talk with y'all about today. I appreciate you sticking with me through this presentation. Uh, we have plenty more uh, informational videos on the peer program website, and I implore y'all to take a look at those as well. And thank you so much.